This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Mark Cerny is probably best known now as the lead system architect for the PlayStation 4, but he actually might have one of the most enduring careers in the video game industry, starting out in 1982 with making one of my favorite arcade games, Marble Madness. And uh, he has just been making games all along ever since, one of the smartest minds in the industry. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, you were at Atari about 1982, working on games, and obviously back then, so much of the creativity had to be working around all the technical limitations. Now you've put out a console with eight gigs of DDR5 in it. How does that sort of change your approach to design and how you think about making a game and what's essential to be in it? Well, I, the, the technology is a lot easier to work with. I mean, if we wanted to make any change to our code back in 1982, anything would be 15 minutes at least before we saw the effects. And, and you know, the guys in the office were happy because the environment that they had come from was a pure hardware environment where you just had to build it and see if it worked mm -hmm. or not. I mean, believe it or not, breakout, no CPUs, no program. That's just all hardware. Wow. Yeah, so if you don't like the gameplay, go build another mo motherboard with different <laughs> chips and maybe it turns out better. Uh, and, and today, you know, it's very responsive and very fluid. And it's not really about the programmer writing that code. It, it's about the, the vision of, of the creative director. And how, I mean, for, for, for you, how, how have you changed over those times? You know, what's, what's, what's the essential Mark Cerny game now? Well, um, you know, you have to reinvent yourself in this business mm -hmm. about every five or ten years because uh, everything changes so quickly. Um, I mean, the console, when I got into the business in 1982, was the Atari 2600, and it was dying. And then we didn't have consoles for a while, yeah, right? Yeah, we had because a few bad years. <laughs> the great crash. Um, I've tried to um, stay with the high end of development, whatever that would be. So a big team back in 1982 would be two people. Uh, and then um, today, you know, I've tried to stay with AAA, what we now call AAA console development. But I mean, that r requires um, really coming up with a different skill set. You know, I, I remember I became most aware of you during the era that you were kind of helping out with both Naughty Dog on the Jack and Daxter series and with Insomniac on Ratchet and Clank. And one of the key things about both those games is that there were no load screens. And that was really kind of like, a, that, that, that was a big deal back in the, in the early aughts. And that, what, what are things, what's, what's the equivalent of that now? Like that, that next step that game development sort of has to take on? I think really we're moving away from a technology emphasis and we're heading more towards a gameplay emphasis. Uh, the technology is ultimately just supposed to be invisible, right? As a player, you don't want to know anything. Uh, you just want uh, that giant virtual world, whether it be Skyrim or Grand Theft Auto V, you want it to function. You want it to be immersive. And so to the extent that the technology can just get out of the way, I think it's serving its function. Um, in, in, in your experience, sort of talking to developers as you're making the PlayStation 4. I mean, what's kind of your sense? It's kind of, I don't want to call you the grand poobah, but you know, where are developers wanting to go? Where's the direction the creativity might be headed in this, in this industry? So the developers are very interested in reducing the friction of creating the games. I mean, they these days, not only do they have to ship that title, but they have to, if there's any problems, they have to patch it, uh, and then they have to come up with whatever enhancements uh, they want to put in over the next six months of e or a year. And we're transitioning now, I feel, from these um, very um, specific, here's a map pack, uh, kind of downloadables to a future where even in the consoles, that game that you're playing is getting updated every day. That's the future. The technology has to just work. It has to be invisible on the developer side as well. Um, so let's go back to Marble Madness. Um, not a very narrative heavy game. You, know, it was, you, you, you really didn't have much of that. You had to kind of infer the, the marble is in danger. But uh, over your career, as the technology has improved, we can start telling more and more stories. And I was curious what your feeling is, because you came out of an era that was all gameplay. And now, you know, you, you have worked on, on games like Uncharted, you advise, and there's so much story there. Is, in, in your mind, is there a balance? How much has to be gameplay and how much has to be sort of experience? Yeah, so we even had a balance back in the day. Like Pac-Man was the Metal Gear Solid of arcade games because after every stage that you cleared, you had to watch a mini movie about Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man and the, the chase yeah, yeah, and no, things you're like right. that. So with Marble Madness, there, there actually was a story and there was a bit of a debate. Do we put the story in, a very forgettable story, uh -huh. but do you put the story in the game or not? 
I think, um, y yes, I mean, you have the issue of how much narrative, but you also have the issue of how, how much to interleave the narrative. And so, you know, I was a first-time creative director uh, recently, and really I'm starting to understand some narrative, it goes in at such a fundamental level into the play that it just evaporates. It's the quick time event. It's the thing that mm -hmm. happens as you turn the corner. And some of it, you know, you're going to lean back and watch, and it's the ratio of those two, more so than the absolute amount of narrative that is really critical. I mean, do you think, I mean, I, I would say about five years ago, every interview I did, so I would say, yeah, we're, 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 we're making a cinematic game. And there was always that sense of, why are you chasing the movies? There's something very unique and special to video games themselves. I mean, are, 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 are we really discovering what the narrative potentials of video games are. Yes, I mean, I think we're still um, learning. I mean, we're at the point where these now stand alone on the basis of their narrative. That's why uh, mm -hmm. The Last of Us picked up 300 Game of the Year awards. <laughs> uh, so um, I think um, fairly soon, you know, we don't need to pursue this with a chip on our shoulder, you know, bit of ego there, we've got to show movies and TV that we too can tell a story. I think we'll be able to relax and say, yes, we can tell a story, we can do it in the context of a vid video game, what story do we want to tell? Um, when you started out, and I've, 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 I've known that, that you grew up in my hometown of Berkeley, California, and you've mentioned going to the Lawrence Hall of Science, which was where I learned, you know, my, my basic computer stuff up there. Um, what, what was it like starting out in an industry that seemed to be so uncertain of itself back in the 80s? And obviously there was kind of a crash coming from, from the Atari generation. And when did you realize, hold on, this is not going to go away? Oh, it was tough in the early years. So I joined Atari in January of 1982. Uh, put that in perspective, that's three months after uh, uh, Centipede released mm -hmm. in the arcades. The arcade game crash happened in the summer of 1982. So I'm six months in. 17, year olds, 17 years old, it's my first job, and six months in, the layoffs start, and the soul searching starts. Uh, we went through four rounds of layoffs in the three years that I was there. We changed our president uh, four times at Atari. Um, and then getting out of that and then joining Sega, who uh, was struggling with the master system that had a 4% market share to Nintendo's 94%. I mean, the first decade of my career <laughs> was very much, you know, <laughs> there's this feeling, you get this game out and you get it soon, or you don't have a job when you come to work the next day. Uh, and I didn't really um, start feeling any sort of security that maybe I'd have a future in games until after Crash and Spyro came out. And that was, I mean, so that's... 15 years after I started. Wow. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's... Was, no, was, was it just your love for the medium that uh, allowed you to just oh. exist with that level of insecurity? I know I was making a fine living, but I mean, I remember this soul searching in the late 90s. Um, and can I buy a house in Los Angeles? You know, do I have a job the next year that will allow me to get this house and still pay every month? Um, for the loan. And I, I decided, I, I had like uh, a year of Spyro in the marketplace and I decided that probably I had enough career at that point that I could go ahead and settle down in LA. Um, it's, it's fun that, that you mentioned Crash and Spyro. Um, you worked on those games, you, you worked on the Sonic the Hedgehog games. Um, we're not, those are a genre that we're not seeing that much of anymore. And I'm curious sort of if you have any desire to see if we can bring them back. Um, I, I know that there, there's oh, risk-averse publishers out there no, that don't want to touch No, I mean, I would love to see the completely retro 16-bit side-scroller. In fact, you know, Sega should do one for Sonic. So that would be great. <laughs> I would buy that game. Um, it's, it's funny that, that I was just thinking about playing the HD uh, remake of, of the Jack and Daxter games. And how, when I was playing the first one, that we didn't have kind of full camera controls back then. <laughs> and like, you know, trying to sort of unlearn sort of the, 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 the ease. And I'm, I'm wondering, have we made things too easy on the player now that everything kind of works in games? Oh, no, I think we, we supply plenty of challenge. I mean, uh, we've got you know, 16 buttons on the controller and some involved story and missions to accomplish and all of that. Uh, but the player no longer has to kind of work around the technical limitations of the game, just as much as you don't have to work around the technical limitations of a particular system. Sure, the basic stuff now works, and we've also integrated usability very well into our development, and that was gone, um, didn't really exist in the mid, 
90s. Uh, you know, we'd just kind of play the game a couple times, and if we could finish it, we'd ship it, not realizing, of course, that the team would be intimately familiar with how to play the game, and no consumer would do. <laughs> now we're at this really great spot where we do the usability. So we get the consumers in there, have them play, do they understand what they're doing, is it too hard for them? These are two very separate issues. And then we're free as game creators to say, you know, do I want to change the game, which is sort of the portal model? Mm -hmm. Um, very nicely tuned set of challenges where each builds on the previous one. Or do you want to just say, no, figuring out how to play the game is the game, which is sort of the braid model. Now, I probably need to upgrade these analogies given that's been, you know, those have been out for a couple of years. <laughs> but I love that you can pick with full knowledge of how the consumer is going to respond to your title. You can pick how much you want to do on, on their behalf. Um, what's in your career? What do you think was one of the most exciting moments that you've gotten to be part of? Exciting moments. Well, it was pretty good la year last year, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Other than the recent successes you've benefited from. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess um, for me, it was great working with Andy and Jason at Naughty Dog and Ted and Ted Price and the Hastings brothers and at Insomniac, and a lot of that had to do with with my 15 years of how hard it is. Oh, after I, I left Sega, I went to, to work for um, Crystal Dynamics making 3DO titles, oh. right? So there's, that was my next challenge. <laughs> did, so, did, did, did people just start to shun you because you kind of brought doom in your wake? <laughs> it wasn't that these titles weren't profitable. It was just that it was definitely a struggle and we were not market leader in, mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form. And so to get out of there and work with uh, you know, uh, Jason Rubin and Ted Price, who are amazing creative directors, and work with these teams that have this energy and this environment where we felt that anything would be possible, you know, those, uh, those were really memorable days. And I don't want to be the kind of guy that looks back and says, yeah, you know, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. I want to be the guy who's focused on the future. But the fact is, you know, 1994 through 1998, in Los Angeles, you know, we were all around 30 years old. That was just magical. And I mean, could, did you have any idea that it would be the industry that it is now? No, in fact, we couldn't, we couldn't get people to move to LA and work in games in those days. Trying to build staff at Naughty Dog in 1994, there weren't developers down there. You know, it isn't like today where we've got Blizzard with I don't know how many employees yeah, in Orange and half County of and all these, yeah, <laughs> all these developers in LA. You know, there was no one in the area. And um, trying to lure anybody down, they'd think, oh, if, you know, if I quit that company, what would I even do in Los Angeles? Whereas today, it's, it's so easy. It's one of the centers of game development. No, yeah, it is. And uh, you're right there at the center, at the center of game development. Mark, thank you so much for your time. I cannot wait to see what comes from you next. Thank you so much. All right, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor, lynda.com. lynda.com is an online learning company that teaches software, creative, and business skills. You can learn anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can try lynda.com for free for seven days by signing up at lynda.com slash rev3games.